checking out the volume situation here to make sure that I can hear you. Hi, Val. Hi, Val. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, perfect. Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome Hare Krishna, to everyone. everyone. Um, we're, we're live on Instagram and Facebook, so it's a bit, we're getting some feedback here, but bear with us. <laughs> um, so excited to have you all back to our regular Saturday talks. Um, today we have a very dear friend, Gopi Gita, from all the way from America, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> she is um, a educator, she's a teacher, she's a mother, she's a wife, she's got loads of years of experience being with children and, and passing on the spiritual side of education. I'm so, so excited to be here with her having this conversation. So she's actually the vice principal of the TKG Academy, which is a Krishna school, a Hare Krishna school in America, in Texas. Um, and she's also the regional representative um, in the Ministry of Education in Northern America, and she'll tell us what that's about. And she is uh, married to Rupa Manohar Das, wonderful Rupa Prabhu, and has two beautiful teenage boys, um, Raja and, Raju and Nitai. They're both um, doing high school and college, <laughs> uh, excelling in their education, and just such wonderful kids. So. She's a real inspiration in my life. I'm so happy to have you, Gopi, with us. Thank you. And a big warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, Kishori. I'm so excited to be here as well. And thank you to all of you who have joined. So nice to have you with us. Um, as she said, my name is Gopi Gita Shomakar. And me and Kishori have been friends since we were very young, teenagers. <laughs> We yes, India a little bit together and had a lot of fun. It's so cool to be with you here, Kishori, on this channel. I know. Amara Mota Benjeva. Any Gujaratis in the house? Go <laughs> Piggy. Morty Benjeva. <laughs> so, um, well, we're going to go through a little bit of our, you know, your background, how you grew up in, in America and how your parents joined the Krishna consciousness movement. Um, so, yeah, let's let's begin with that, shall we? Um, your your parents, how did they did they you know get interested? Obviously, being in America back in what, the seventies, eighties, um, and then to join <laughs> that must have been such a big step for them. Yes, and so it's interesting because they probably had a similar journey to your parents. Um, yeah. My father actually came to America in the early seventies. 1971, 1972. Wow. And he actually came here to become a, a doctor, a dentist, to finish his education and start clinics. And right. his parents had sent him to America for like, you know, material aspirations, material achievement. Paisa <laughs> banava. Ah, paisa banava, exactly. <laughs> to make money. But get so successful in life. <laughs> and he came and the, when he get off, got off the plane, he saw the devotees distributing books and he had already actually been in touch with Shri Prabhupada. He had gone to a oh, no. program with his father in Bombay um, no. years prior. Oh, and my dad had also read um, Chaitanya's life and teachings in the library when he was, he said he was in seventh grade. And so wow. he already had some initial attraction to Gaudiya Vaishnavism and Krishna consciousness. And he immediately found that there was a temple in Evanston in Chicago. Um, he was in Chicago and started attending. This was 1973, 74, 75, and that right. became his life. And wow. So, that is just such an exciting story. Incredible. And then he and then he decided to join the temple. He did well. Oh. Actually, he was one of the few who um, was balancing both the academic right. and the spiritual, not the academic, but he went to college and then he started clinics. He opened up three clinics. And so wow. he had a full day Mangalarti all the way until nighttime because he was going to the to his work. And he said he would feel so almost like transcendentally envious of the devotees who were going on the distribution. And at that time we had um, Tamal Krishna Maharaj and wow. Shri Maharaj and Keshav Bharti Swami, all of them were in the Chicago Temple and they were traveling right. countries and book distribution was like at its height, 76, 77, 78, like that time. And so he he remembered like wishing that he didn't have to go to work and make money, 
But then he was also supporting the temple and building the congregation and serving in that no way. way. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I'm just so, because I never heard this part. I guess I never asked you. I never, yeah. I was never like, oh, how did your parents join? So sorry, I'm trying to sort out my light. It kind of died on me, as you can tell. Whoops, oh. too bright, too bright. You look okay. perfect. Wonderful. Perfect. So you guys grew up in Chicago. You and Gora, wonderful yeah. Gora Mummy. If you, if anyone's familiar, this is Gora Mummy's sister. She's obviously also a huge personality in India and everywhere doing kirtans. So you and Gora grew up in Chicago. So I'm the Moti Ben of you two, both of you girls, Gora and Kishori. <laughs> you guys are making big waves in India right now, taking oh, India by sure. spiritual storm, both of you are. And I'm the Moti Ben, I'm lucky to just get all of the, all of you your- You are the <laughs> inspiration, you're the inspiration, Gopi, for real. Like when I think about, anyway, we're getting to that. But honestly, um, throughout my life, and watching you, you know, just blossom into your, um, married life into your career into your motherhood and just how you're sharing so much um, spiritual depth with the world honestly i am just i've been just inspired my whole life and just trying to follow in footsteps so thank you for being that role model that every everyone needs everyone needs that and i and i um right that's what we're here to find out sorry thank you one thing that was very different um with the way we were raised and something that even other Hare Krishna kids didn't experience is my sister and I were raised as basically totally American because right. we were the only um, daughters of Indian family that were full-time temple devotees in the 80s. Um, wow. The congregation and the communities were all Westerners in those days. Um, wow. It opened up, the congregation opened up a little later, like in the 90s and later. And so both of us had quite a journey in, in balancing our traditional aspects of our culture, in balancing Krishna consciousness, and in balancing How you do it? Because modern life in America. Sorry, sorry. To, yeah, uh, because when I, when I spent, what, nine years in LA and most yeah. of the Indians that I met there, um, have completely lost their culture unfortunately i don't want to i'm not making a blanket statement and i shouldn't but yeah many it's, it's harder in in the west coast possibly and the east coast it's a little bit different because new jersey and if you have a community an indian community you can kind of hold together your culture but a lot a lot of the indians that i've met in, in america struggle with that I, you know the identity like am i nice. what do i still want to be indian do i yes, <laughs> so yes. how <laughs> How did you manage that? You know, it's really about, and it's you know, it was, it's been an, it's been a journey, as you yes. know. But it's really about um, identifying what are the bhakti principles, what are the key principles of our faith, of our values that Sri the Prabhupada sacrificed his life to bring to us, and those principles are underlying in every culture, every tradition, every religion, and identifying what of that makes me, whether it be Indian or the labels I am, the designations I have, what are those key principles that I can keep no matter where I'm at, no matter what situation I'm in, you know, and so exactly. that's- So understanding that it's beyond- that that. So, Yeah, right. right. Understanding that it's beyond being Indian or Western because actually the Sanatan Dharma is eternal. It's a, it's not just a designation as you're saying. Um, so, so that, 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 needs a very deep understanding. It, it goes much deeper than just the superficial, okay, or, or, you know, it's not just the I'm ritual. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I go with Gora and live and she speaks Hindi and I'm like, try atka true Hindi bolti <laughs> Even my Gujarati is not so good, but it's great to hear the Gujarati. <laughs> oh, no, but... Well, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's but, but beyond going beyond that, just the Hindi yes. and the Gujarati and the and the little daily ritualistic things that you do to actually hold on to the Sanatan Dharma is yes. something much deeper than that. It's much deeper than just the language. It's much deeper than the way we dress and the way we talk or the, what we eat. It's yes, um, yes. So I think we're going to get into the heart of of the spiritual education that your parents obviously really did a great job. I'm passing back to you. Uh, if you want to touch up on how that how that was for you. Yes, and so um, spiritual education. Luckily, we were in the temples most of our life. 
um, we were able to balance it all. Mami and Pitaji were really, it was really important to them that we be of the world, but not in the world, so to speak, that we balance it, that we not be extremely isolated and extremely closed off, that we be relevant and practical and connected to everything right. going on in society. At the same time, we had a really strong foundation of waking up early, studying Bhagavad, studying scripture, um, chanting Japa, learning all of the stories. You know, the scripture, okay. the Bhagavatam, it tells so many ancient stories of love and love lost and trials and triumph and how to navigate that. For a child, when you hear that, it sets the stage for your whole life, you know, 80 years ago. You see how the great sages and the great kings have navigated it. And so it makes it so much easier for you to just imbibe that, that this is how I will navigate it. Absolutely. I can't agree more with that, the, with the last statement especially, um, that it actually lasts your whole life. Whatever you hear, these samskaras, this education is not just, it's not just tales, fairy tales. It's not just um, stories that, uh, or they, as they call it, mythology. It's the worst word we could ever use. And most of India, unfortunately, as Indians, we, we're so easy, we're so eager to accept this term, mythology, as if it's not real. <laughs> Yeah. Why? Why? Why are we okay with? Anyways, I'm getting a bit uh, sidetracked. But the point is, if we actually believe in the principles and the values that that these stories um, are sharing with us, it can literally change a child's life. It can it can be the difference of uh, you know positivity versus a really heavy, intense, negative experience of life. Isn't that what we want to give our children? Isn't that what we? Uh, give them tools that will last a lifetime, as you say. Yes, absolutely. And the age is psychologically in their development, the age from zero to five, from six to 12, from 13 to 16. These ages are literally identity building. Every single thing they're experiencing, the part of the brain that's like firing off who I am. When you think of a memory, when you when you go back in, um, to a memory in your adult life, then you have a specific part of the brain that like shows right. active activity or a movement. And for a child, those same memories that are happening when they're in that age up to 16, that particular area of the brain is where identity building happens. And so wow. it's like every single thing that a child is experiencing is part not of something that happened in the past, even if it was in the past at that time. This is a complicated thing I'm trying to explain, but <laughs> it is it is part of who they are. It becomes a fabric, part of their fabric of their existence. And so you know, because everything we watch right now and hear, and we get memories of our childhood. And that's why childhood samskaras are so powerful and so important. And I love what you just said that it's identical. Something. Sorry, what was that? There's an echo. Someone said there's an echo. I don't know if it's my yeah. phone or what it is. Uh, I have turned it down, but I, I don't know what to do. Yeah. This is always an issue when I go live on both. Oh, yeah? Is the echo yeah, maybe is. because I don't have headphones or we don't have headphones? Oh, oh I, I do. Okay. Do you have headphones that we can put on? I'd have to get up and go get him. <laughs> I think we're okay. really bad. Can someone comment whether you can hear it properly or not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do hear a slight echo, but I don't know how bad it is on on Instagram. Yeah, I think right, until then, until good. then, I um, keep going. Where you know, when me and Kishori get together, we we're can talk, talk for hours. For hours. hours. <laughs> it's so interesting uh, to hear you speak and to share what my thoughts are. Oh, someone's saying it's fine. So we're going to continue. They can Thank hear you. us fine. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, Iskand Lester and uh, Komal Bhardwaj. Thank you so much for your, for your feedback. So we were talking about identity. And I find this the most important thing, especially as, as, as Hindus, not just Indians, whether you're Western, you know, any kind of Hindu. If you believe in this Vedic system and the, way, the Vedic wisdom, um, identity identifying with this wisdom is something that we really need to treasure and work towards as opposed to being unsure at the best or completely rejecting it in, the, in, in what is you know so common these days so uh, i really i really you know resonated with that with what you're sharing that those crucial years 
of sharing the wisdom with children so that they can really, um, you know, understand who they are. And this identity is very important for not just, you know, not just as, as children, but then the identity crisis carries on through life if you don't actually understand where you belong or what you're, you know, what you believe in or what your parents and ancestors and your entire nation believes in. If you have no clue what it means, Yes. Wow. Can that that can cause so much mental agony and confusion and yes, so and you're say you were so it's so true, Kishori, the agony and the confusion. And you know, for everybody who's listening, all of us have been born, we have come into a body full of yes. agony and confusion. Because like Kishori said, Sanatan Dharma means that we have eternal relationship and life and um, confidence in our relationship with Sri Krishna. And mm -hmm. we made the choice that we're going to separate ourselves from him and we're going to enter this body. And of course, you know, sansara, so the birth and death. And yeah. we're going to, um, so automatically we have insecurities. Just yes. coming to this material body comes the insecurity. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not confident. What about yeah. this? What about it's just part of being a human being in the material world. You don't ever hear about the residents of the spiritual planet saying, I'm not good enough. They know they're good enough. They have Krishna with them. Exactly. <laughs> and that that I would say is the that you we really just hit the nail on the head with with if, with the next question. I mean, we haven't really <laughs> finished the first one. But why is spiritual education for children so important? Because it gives this kind of um, just this uh, never ending source of inspiration and inner strength and self belief and belonging and <laughs> all these beautiful things that you can't buy. <laughs> you can't buy in this world. So, spirituality, it, it's a no brainer if you're not giving your children. Uh, value-based spiritual uh, spiritual education. We're really, as parents, we're doing them a huge, huge disservice, and it's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair on the child to not give them that and only give them material education to get money and a job and all that. So, um, I feel like we haven't finished the first part of the question, but should we just jump to the second? With the flow, it's it's working out. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to finish the first part so did you go to a gurukul how did you get that spiritual education and the love for it how did you become both of you are just such shining examples of uh great parenting by your parents and just just living your life in such a beautiful way and sharing so what worked in your childhood so what worked was my father and my mother gave us a very nurturing bhakti um, relationship with them the primary relationship that was established very beautifully was the one with my father and my mother. And mm. the second thing is they sacrificed their time. My dad sacrificed his own career, his own needs to bring us to um, schools that were run by Srila Prabhupada's disciples mm. and that started early in the day with a connection to, like Kishori was saying, Sanatan Dharma, and a connection to Krishna at a very young age. And Kishore, you went through the same thing. Your parents also did so much with you. They took so much care for you. And I remember visiting all of you who know Kishore. I visited her when she was 12. And I'll never forget those moments. Also a shining example of someone who was raised in such a beautiful tradition. So Guru, we went to Hare Krishna school um, for the duration of our childhood. We also did some public school and some private school and some homeschooling. So I've kind of been through all of the different types of schools you can find in America. <laughs> Which just makes you a prime candidate or, you know, really primed you to become an educator, to become involved in, in schooling. So that's that's wonderful. I really like what you said about spending time and, and, and establishing that real connection with your children, like as parents. I can say that um, even though my parents were so busy, like they were right, they were serving in a mission in, in one sense, but they, they made the time to make sure we understood the real value of life and the real, the, the important stuff they made time for. It wasn't like, oh, let's go shopping or let's watch movies. I mean, that's nice. It's, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> condemning any of that because I do it with my kids, but, but they really highlighted the, the time that was, uh, important and meaningful. They 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 made sure that we understood the difference between the two. 
Yes, and I love what you're saying. So my dad, he made ice cream as exciting as ice cream can be. He got it. <laughs> He got us new clothes. You know, we were two young girls and we loved jewelry and clothes, especially yeah. my sister. He took us shopping. He he gave us all the material excitement and, you know, one could say pleasures, luxuries. But he also made doing kirtan with us um, and connecting japa with us and um, reading shastra with us to be as exciting as ice cream. I remember, <laughs> I remember it was like, you know, Kishori, we would have to go to Mangalarti, and when you're 13 years old, you're not really. Mangalarti is at 4:30 a.m. For anyone who doesn't know what Mangalarti is, we'd we, we'd rise at four in the morning. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, he he never, and he he never yelled, he never raised his voice, he never made us feel like we were not good enough to be with him. Wow. And especially wow. with me, that was my experience with my dad. That he like journeyed life with me, especially in my teenage years. And wow. teenage years is a whole change in the psychology of children. We never yes. felt, and even when I had my own two children, there's no such thing as rebellion. There's no such thing as terrible twos. These wow. are external markers that labels people have put on because they don't understand psychological psychological development of children. Mm -hmm. And so you put this negative, you know, mm -hmm. sign on the child. Oh, he's a teenager. Oh, terrible. Yeah, yeah. But and it's it kind of. And by labeling and the child along with them right right so. right okay okay so that that was really jam-packed yeah. i love i love where we're going with that that that, <laughs> that that first of all your your parents made it fun whether you were doing material or spiritual things that they were, they were both equally important and equally exciting as a child because it's true. We've got four kids, and when we try to do the arti, you know, if I yell and shout at them to try to get them, it's just not going to work, and then they're going to be miserable. So that, and, and from my own experience, I remember that that doesn't work. You've got to be, make it exciting, and then promise them the hot chocolate afterwards, or a nice, you know, the stories that they love afterwards. So, so it's got to, it, there's a, there's a give and take. We we meet the children at at their level. I uh, I really love that you shared that, and. Um, the importance of not labeling the, the phases of children as being negative or positive or just kind of, you know, disconnecting ourselves from them. Oh, they're just teenagers. Oh, they're just rebellious. Because yeah. that means we're almost not taking the responsibility of dealing with them on their level. We're kind of saying that's just the way it is. You know, so um, if you could expand on that. For failure. You've already set them up for failure even before. Society has already set them up for failure, for misunderstandings for judgments just by these labels. Anyways, it's a side topic, but I, like I told you, I have well, a to it, uh, I, I, to to <laughs> I know, so sorry for anyone watching this and if it feels a bit chaotic. This is two sisters and two really old friends trying to, you know, act all uh, formal here, so. <laughs> Um, but who this, haven't talked to each other in way too long. In a long time, in a long time. Uh, but we're going to rectify that. <laughs> so I, moving on from this positive upbringing, um, which really highlights the need for parents, if there's any parents listening to this, or um, young people, that this is just, that's the only way to go forward, to create a positive spiritual environment for the children. You can't really fake it, you know. If, you can't be like, you do this while I do this. Your child is never going to read the Bhagavad Gita or do spiritual activities if we aren't doing it with them, right? Yes, that's the number one. That was the first thing I was going to say about the importance of how the how. How do you do a bhakti life? You cannot sit across the room and point your finger to a chair and say, go chant. Just like when you're brushing your teeth with your child, when you're teaching your child how to brush the teeth, you're showing them, you're standing next to them, you're moving the toothbrush, you're saying first we get the top, then the bottom, then the inside. When you're showing the child in every environment, every time we try to give an instruction from to a child re far removed, then that instruction will most likely not get done or it'll right. be done, but done incorrectly. And then we end up getting upset. Better yeah. to do it correctly and go side journey side by side with your child. Now, Krishna, 
for all of you parents who are listening. The Lord has very specifically chosen every single child in your home, their background, their karma, their proclivities, their nature, whether their nature gels with you, whether their nature contrasts with yours, for your, for your increasing a loving relationship and for your purification. And so each of these children are like, they're like specifically just met for you. And so you're supposed to journey side by side with the child, not just remove yourself from such a distance and then get upset when they don't rise to your expectations. So Kishori, what you're saying about um, making sure that our children are learning spiritual things, material things even they should learn side by side, but even more important that spiritual things they learn side by side and you make it joyful. And making it joyful doesn't necessarily mean having to like tickle them while they're chanting their japa. <laughs> Making it joyful means just doing it with them and laughing, singing. And as soon as it becomes a nagging chore, if your child does not want to do the arti, please You're stop. Ruining it for them. Stop. Stop. And I love watching you, Kishore, you go live with all of your kids. It's the most <sighs> thing because you let them you just let them be you let them be themselves the front wow. the younger ones sit in the front and they're like looking here and, and they talk and they go to the side well, you know i'm live on camera so we yes. try <laughs> yes, but you're, you still you have such a joyful spirit with your kids and you let them be kids and it's amazing clearly there are rules you know clearly there are standards and, and yeah. Procedures our children need to learn how to follow, um, you know, just for living in society. Mean, that doesn't mean no discipline and no boundaries. That actually, one of the greatest mistakes we can make as parents is not have any boundaries and not show them self-discipline. Because, you know, my kids go to Krishnavanti school. One of the main uh, virtues that they learn is self-discipline. And I, we were, I was trying to explain it to them in their language. And actually, I realized there's no way you can teach a child self-discipline in words they, ha they they will only they will only see it and experience it oh my my parents wake up at this time oh they the first thing they do is shower and brush they don't run down and eat and watch tv or you know they, they, you have to you show them through example what self-discipline is or what kindness is or what any any value is especially spiritual values it, so so what you're touching on is um, again, whether it's the positives or negatives, we are showing, teaching them through example. And uh, so the power, power and recognizing it when it when it's shown and it's displayed, we have a tendency and this um, has come from the psych pop psychology of the 80s and the 90s to praise a lot of like, good job. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. But actually, if you read the scriptures, and even there's so many philosophies coming out lately in how to do this, it's just noticing the specific act that your child has done and tying it to equality. I notice that you put the dishes away without me asking. That shows me you're responsible. You oh, want to make a mirror image of your child. When the child looks at you, he remembers that my mom thinks the highest yeah. expectation of me. My mom thinks me to be responsible. And then oh, he envisions himself as responsible. But you know, moms, and I do the same thing even today. I have a 16-year-old. Wow, it's weird saying that to you. I have a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old boy. And even still, I the mind is so accustomed to like, saying how our kids are not good enough do this put your shoes there why did you not bring your homework why are you it's just the natural like stuff that comes out of our mouth we're if focusing on the negative we need to yeah. do the opposite oh i noticed like if the child is cleaning the dishes or doing their chores and there's three things that are not done but everything else is complete we'll notice the three things that are not done. <laughs> it's such human nature isn't it to criticize actually this kali yuga is right it's like the, the age of quarrel and hypocrisy, it's exactly what you're just stating, that we focus on the one thing that's not right. Yeah. So it's a great learning tool as a parent itself to actually, let's focus on what they are getting right and then help them with, 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 with whether or not, obviously. Um, go on. <laughs> Yes, so uh, Nadia, Hare Krishna, nice to have you here. My voice is echoing. She's saying, I hope it's still, maybe I'll slow Sorry. down the voice. <laughs> <Kidding>. <laughs> and so what you want to do is you want to notice, this is the nurtured heart approach, and you want to notice the specific action that they've done. 
I notice just the unbiased, non-judgmental action that they've done. And you want to add a quality to, the, to quality to do that. So we do that in the classrooms with the students and it works magic with the children, with our kids, old and young. Even do this with your husband and you don't have to. <laughs> it's true, with anyone. Yes, yeah. recognize, recognize a specific quality that you appreciate. It increases your own gratitude and for children, it creates a whole world of who they are. Now they see themselves as somebody that's responsible or kind or generous. Instead, we end up doing the opposite. And so this I is love what you said. With children. Yes. Um, I love what you said about creating that mirror image. And we are creating that image for them. Yes. Um, and at least in the early years. Uh, so the, the more positive that we that image is that we've created for them, the more they'll try to live up to it. So. So we're really guiding them and kind of creating their future for them um, in a very subtle but deep and powerful way that we may not even realize we're doing it. We're not, we're thinking they're failing and this is all their problems and why can't they just get it together and why, you know, but actually the more we do that cycle, the more we're, we're putting them into that box for the rest of their life. Yes, yes, we are. And you know what it is, Kishori? Children come into this world at age zero. And thank you, Matarish. I'm glad that you're getting something out of it. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, they're, they're already are very clear on why they have taken this birth. Internally, the Lord is sitting in their heart. He is guiding them, especially children born in bhakti homes. And they already know what their destination will be because the Lord guides them. The Lord yeah. is already their best friend and telling them and guiding them which home that they have to be born into. And then, you know, we're now responsible for them. If we can take a step back and just notice them, recognize them, and encourage them in their direction. A lot of times, parents, we put our own idea of what we think our kids have to be, and we stop, we very intensely stop their own growth, in a sense. And especially right. spiritually, the child may be like, you know, and it's happened, You, I'm sure you've experienced this. The child may be so excited about going to the temple and seeing the deities, say nine or 10. And as soon yeah. as the kid walks in the temple room and makes some little mistake, like forget to pay the obeisances properly to Srila Prabhupada or forget to, yeah. then there's a block. Yeah. Suddenly a it's like, you're not, oh, you couldn't have been. My husband yeah. actually yes. was raised, you know, my husband was raised in a very intense, strict environment. Well. In some areas, he went right. to certain ashrams that were very intense. And there was a recording of one of his ashram teachers that somehow or another, he ended up pressing play on Kishori. And I listened to it when I first met him. And this was what inhibited his desire to chant Hare Krishna, that when he would chant, the kid was like six. And when he would chant, his this teacher would be yelling at him for not chanting pr properly. And the tape is, you're going to become a juvenile delinquent. And I heard it with my own ears to a six year old. And so it's like, we do that with spiritual activities. We have such rigid, intense expectations of our children to do it the way we think they should do it. Let them yeah. be spontaneous. Let them be natural in their love for God, in their love for Krishna. Let them show yeah. it and then just like a budding flower. Education yeah. is not meant to pour information into a child's vessel. Education is not a vessel that needs to be filled. Education is a spark that needs to be fanned and brought out. And just we are the facilitators of their development. We're not the controllers of their development. Wow, that's so powerful. Wow, that is so incredible. Because um, we think, you know, th th it's such a fine line between, well, if I don't get them to chant, they're going to, I'm, you know, the, I feel this pressure. I'm just talking from yeah. personal, ex it, because I also know that it's a duty of a parent to make sure that the child understands what's right and wrong. You know, the self-discipline, like we just talked about, like we show through actions and um, examples. So... There's that pressure of doing it right, but at the same time, not botching it up so badly that the child never wants to have anything to do with that. <laughs> so how do we get create that balance? Just so you know, there's loads of questions coming in and uh, I don't even know where to begin because, um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's 
<laughs> like, do we have? Does she have a blog? I put up a question earlier. Yes, you can follow Gopi Gita Showmaker. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, she has a page on Facebook where she posts live stuff regularly, and um, she, you know, she obviously has teenagers. So someone's asking how to create spiritual habits in teenage children. Um, yes, so please um, go to gopigita.com. I have parenting seminars I offer and parenting workshops, individual and community workshops, as well as edu um, teacher training workshops and I've been doing it gradually through COVID. It's a little harder because it's through Zoom, but please go to gopigita.com and just, you can find out all the information there. And she, I've attended some of these and I've met her children. I've been hosted in her family and it, you're, it's gonna be worth every minute that you spend <laughs> trying to understand this because she's got two teenage children who are excelling in their uh, material education in normal college and, um, and also just, putting in so much beautiful time and effort in their spiritual life. So um, thank you. Thank you for doing this invaluable work for, for society. It's a, it's a thankless task, I feel, in some ways, but it's the most necessary one out there. So Kishore, you asked me the question. One of the questions was, why did you, why did you get into this? Yes. And I feel like I want to share that. I just, for some reason, my laptop is not charging. I'm so sorry. I need this to make okay. sure I figure the charge out before it dies. So just <laughs> with me for a That's second. Okay. That's okay. Um, well, I'm going to go through some more questions. There's, there's some how to create a spiritual habit in teenagers. We'll get back to that when you come back. <laughs> I don't know why it's not charging. <laughs> if it dies, we'll just do another one okay. <laughs> a little bit later. <laughs> okay, we'll just keep going. Uh, yeah, you keep talking. Just take me off okay. the screen for a second so okay. I can figure this gonna, out. I'm going to take on one more question because I can't answer about teenagers. I don't have any. <laughs> yeah, so what was the question? How do you create spiritual habits in teenagers? How do you create spiritual habits in teenagers? Okay, the way you can do it right now first is don't start when they're teenagers. For anyone who doesn't have teenagers, start when they're younger. I was gonna say that, I was like, I might be a bit too late. <laughs> I didn't wanna say that. But if you have not and, you, and you're still working on it, first identify with them what their habits are that you see that are spiritual. First, mm. only notice the habits they have that are spiritual. Don't notice any habit that's not spiritual. Wow. In your mind, if you need to take a book and write this down every night when you go to bed, what are the two things my child did that showed me he is a spiritually connected being? Wow. You need to see your child as a spiritual being, regardless. <laughs> Your, your 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 computer has died on the live. <laughs> so she has had to, we're going to wait for her to come back on YouTube and Facebook. I'm so sorry, but you're still live on Instagram. Go do that. Go do that. It's okay. So everyone else watching, please uh, continue to hold with us. We're so sorry. <laughs> but while, while I have your attention, I would love to take any questions that you think I can answer because I do not have teenagers. Uh, let's see what we have here. Okay, <laughs> great question. Is anyone else that would like to ask? I know. Okay, what, what do we have here? Right, in my mind, I always say the word no is misleading. Perhaps maybe better, always listen. Let the child or even adult finish what they're saying. If you cut someone short, put your views across, it causes a psychological block. It's absolutely what we're talking about. And I couldn't agree with this more. Um, with our four kids, if I don't, we, because of the way I was raised as a child, I know that I have blocks against, you know, meditating for a long period of time because I had to do it at a very young age. But the more I understand where is the joy coming from? Why do I now really want to have the spiritual practices? It's because the parts that were joyful were so joyful. There's nothing that can compare to that. Like chanting with my friends, being in a temple surrounding, um, it, having really meaningful philosophical 
engaging conversations, having those friends who were like-minded, spiritually motivated people was, was actually so powerful for me. I, that is where the joy came from. And therefore I'm still on this path. If, if there was, if that was missing, if I didn't have that joy, I wouldn't be able to share it now because you know, that's it. We are, the spirit soul is seeking joy, seeking love. So if we want to pass something spiritual, if we want the spirit to flourish, we must make it joyful and loving. Whatever we are teaching them, it must have joy and love in it. So when the children, this doesn't mean the children will not fight you. I don't want to chant. I don't want to do the arti. I don't want to, uh, you know, why do I have to wait to offer the food before I eat it? These are, that, that part of training is difficult. It's almost like that's the journey. That's the journey with the children trying to, trying to make that peaceful, trying to, Right. Uh, sorry. Are you going to be able to come back live on Facebook? Oh, OK. Well, you'll <laughs> you'll be able to hear me. Uh, you won't be able to hear her. That, that, I don't know if that's going to work, though. OK, because you still have the link to join in, right? You'll be able to just join us back. OK, OK, because we need you here. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, you all. But uh, while I have you, what were we talking about? It absolutely has to be joyful and meaningful. That's the only reason why I'm doing any of this. Now, you might think, that we boundaries. Uh, you know, just as important as the love and joy is, in the same, in, same importance is the, the understanding for the child to have self-discipline, to have respect for others to understand, you know, to have that training, that service attitude to, oh, I should serve other people. Not everything is not about me. So I don't tell my children, yeah, whatever you want all the time. No, that is not, that is not the job of a parent to give them whatever they want, whenever they want it. That's spoiling them. So both go hand in hand. We have to teach our children what to do and what not to do. And that doesn't mean it's always going to be peaceful and airy fairy and lovely and happy and yay. No, it also means you have to have those difficult conversations with your children. This is why we don't do this. No, it's not okay to um, bully others or talk down to others or call them names. My children are young, so that's where they're at. <laughs> that's where I can talk about. Um, so I find that actually one of the things that parents uh, find most difficult because I hang around a lot of parents. So I find the most aggravating thing, the most difficult thing as parents, what I hear is, is to pass on that discipline, to pass on that in a positive light, to pass on that, those uh, life tools that are, that are difficult. But the easy stuff is like, yes, yes, I love you so much. You're great. We can say those things very easily. But for, for us to, to uh, pass down the more um subtle things like kindness and respect um because it comes with a lot of challenges and uh, they don't necessarily want to do those things that is where the ch where it gets uh tricky uh, that's where we either give up as parents we're like forget it it's too hard uh it's not worth the headache or we we think we're doing we, we have self-doubt and we think we're doing it wrong and therefore it must be wrong so when she comes back i'm gonna ask her <laughs> But how to continue, continue training in, in a very positive light? How do we pass on those life skills? Yay, she's back. <laughs> uh, I, I think so. Right. Back. Yay. Yay. I don't know what happened, sure but thank you, I'm back. <laughs> Just make sure that the phone volume is off so that the Instagram isn't um, feeding backwards. Okay, sure. Thank you, everyone else, for being so patient today. And uh, you know, is it, uh, it, can you see me? Okay, is it working? Um, your your video is is on is kind of frozen on the. On okay, Facebook. take me out of the show, and I'll figure that out real quick. Yeah, if you just uh, log out, I think you'll have to get out and come back in. Okay. Right. So, how do we do with the difficult stuff? How do we how do we um, not give up when it 
you know, when it gets difficult, because I think that's where most parents, that's where we kind of drop the ball. We do the easy stuff, you know, feeding them, playing with them, putting them in front of the TV, giving them whatever they need, giving them a material education, which we don't really have to be a part of. Like we don't have to be involved. We do their homework a little bit, but that's the easy stuff. Now, the the more tricky stuff is what you have to personally be involved in. It will take your time. Value-based education takes time. It takes um, you have to let go a little bit of your ego when when they're when they question you and they don't want to do it and they're like, no, I don't <laughs> I don't agree with that. Why do I have to do chores? Why do I have to uh, you know be kind to everyone? Why do I why why don't I you know get to be arrogant in the way I am? Why can't I be like those guys in the shows that they watch? And those are, it's tricky because you have to have the right answer. You have to have the right attitude. You have to show through examples. You can't fake that stuff. These are beautiful are you that- things you're saying, such amazing things you're saying. Oh. You have to be, you have to have first the ego. I love what you said about the ego. I'm so sorry, everyone, but I'm here. I'm fine. here with you. I have so much what to happened? share. Okay, so you know, every endeavor that you make, there's going to be complications, there's going mm-hmm. to be problems, and especially what just happened to us is exactly yes. what happens with your children. You All sit in the, the car time. to go to a destination, and it's like suddenly this one has to use the bathroom, that one's hungry, the other one's shirt is too tight, the other one wore the wrong shoes. <laughs> And then you're like, how am I going to make from point A to point B? And then on top yeah. of it, you're telling me I have to teach my child not the dharma? Like exactly. I can get barely get my child to eat his meal on time. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll hit with your first, one of your questions was, and this kind of ties into um, the essence of what bhakti parenting is. When my son was 15, 14, 15. Um, he was quite intelligent, and I can say this is all because of the blessings of the Gurukul that we're here and um, Srila Prabhupada's mercy, that they were raised in a very wholesome, very nourishing environment of Krishna consciousness. And so he had started reading at age two, and wow. by the time he was 13, 14, he was ready to enter the colleges. And he had already started taking his first college classes at age 14 and he was getting rave reviews. The professors were personally calling him. I remember, who I remember that he's boy? an and exceptional, exceptional uh, you know, student, human being, just all around, just a wonderful, wonderful child. It's, it's all testament to you and Rupa Prabhu. For well, so time. I, I definitely believe that it was also just the environment that we raised him in, the Krishna conscious environment, the Krishna conscious philosophy. Yes, but he yes. Was, it takes a village. It takes a village for sure. And this bhakti parenting strategies work for every child, not just you know those who may be quicker at math or, or oh. language arts or whatever. And so we came home, I came home one day at, he was just had turned 15, it just turned 15. And I came home one day and he says, mommy, um, I have a little bit of a problem actually the night before he was throwing up. So I thought oh. it was some kind of a stomach virus. And he came home, I came home from school at 3.30 in the afternoon. I had known that he had a stomach virus. There was something in my heart. I knew that there was something more wrong than just a stomach virus oh. Oh. because I had called a few other um, friends of mine like, oh, Reggie has a stomach virus. What could it be? And I never call, your kids get, you know, illnesses yeah. all the time. You don't call your friends and ask what to do about it. Yeah. And he opens up his textbook. He's in the middle of a government course at college. And he's like, I can't read. Okay. And suddenly this boy who was reading at age two has lost, completely lost his ability to read. Oh, and so gosh. we went into the hospital and immediately they found a tumor on his brain. And oh, I remember it, that. Oh, it's Krishna. really uncomfortable to even speak about, but it is what it is. This is what happened in life. And the brain tumor was in the Wernicke area of communication. And so because of that, he was unable to read. He was able to spell. They asked him to spell beautiful and he was able to spell, it, but he couldn't, he couldn't read. Luckily, Krishna's arrangement after three weeks of tests and a pretty long brain surgery, he had to teach, reteach himself how to read. 
when I was in the hospital, it was the most intense time of my life. But at the same time is when I really had a chance to go very deeply internally. Because when I was nine and 10 and 12 and 15, I felt that I want to work in education for Shiva Prabhupada. I want to establish bhakti parenting and bhakti education for the children, assist wow. Shiva Prabhupada in establishing this and assist our elders in our community in establishing yeah. this in the correct way. And yeah. I had already felt that in my childhood. So at that time I had to go really deeply internally. Like we've given our life to you, our child is yours. And now this is happening. What is the purpose mm -hmm. of it? Why is this happening? At the same time, I also had to talk to him. We had some really deep, wonderful talks and identify with him what is happening in his life and in his psychology at this point that such a big challenge has entered his life. Yeah. And throughout that, we made together so many discoveries. And in the year past that, where he literally had to find the fortitude to reteach himself how to read and get back on track and back into college and the challenges that was faced through that, through that entire journey, the biggest and most powerful um, thing that I learned is that children and families and parents across the world, across the country, across the world, are facing so many challenges in life. You know, the hospitals are filled with children and parents are, there's so much suffering in this world. And if they're not going to learn Sanatan Dharma, if they're not going to connect with a higher principle, then they will be devastated. I was so lucky we had broken, completely broken and shattered to pieces to the point where you cannot get back up. You just you and they they and you know you hear people saying, Oh, religion is just a crutch and blah blah blah. I okay, give me that crutch. We all need the damn crutch. Everyone needs the crutch in life. So be it. So be it if God is your crutch. I will take him any day. <laughs> then yeah. then just completely crumble under the pressure of this intense. Like you're saying, everybody has a challenge to go through. So I, I don't like the word crutch. I would much rather say that is our strength. When you have some hatred towards religion, then you're going to call it a crutch. Oh, it's just for weak people. But actually, the opposite. It is for it is for intelligent people who need who understand we all need that strength. We all need the inner strength. No one is going to be able to do this alone. Just like you were saying, it, it took a village to raise your children. It takes, a, and you know, I'm so just blown away about the story that you're sharing of how I can't even imagine how devastated it must be and how scary and, and fearful it would be to watch your child like go through something like that. It's, it's bad enough if you go through something, but when you watch a child in that kind of, I, I don't think I would have the strength uh, and to watch you go through it, how gracefully I remember your posts and how um, how you were just taking full shelter of Krishna and his teachings. I remember those days and what you were sharing, it still is highlighted in my mind that that is the point of bhakti. So, that. you know, for sure, we have, um, you know, both of us are in such a similar journey. And yesterday you said a beautiful thing to me. You said, we have to do it. I have no choice. I have to do it. And so that whole interaction, Krishna was like, like, what are you doing with your life? Like you mm -hmm. have been brought into this world. Each of us have been brought into this world with a very strong purpose. And the yes. challenges that come into our life are coming into our life because it's like a little nudge where yeah. the Lord in your heart, who you love, otherwise you wouldn't be watching Kishori's video here. You have a very deep connection with Krishna in your heart. And he yeah. is only bringing these small, small challenges or big challenges for you to turn to him and say, hey, um, what am I here for? What yes. was the purpose of all of this? My 15 year old was reading it too. We're like trying to pr promote Prabhupada's school and now he's in the hospital with a tumor. Like, hello, what's the point of it all? And Krishna immediately will answer and he goes internally, you go internally and see and so for me, Kishori, that point was the point where Krishna was saying, like, I realized, I questioned, have I prepared my child for the end of life? Because we had to be faced with the fact that he might leave, you know, and yeah. I had to like, 
think, did I do everything I was supposed to do these past 15 years? Does he know who Krishna is? If it's time to go, will he be able to go to the next destination? Is he confident? And luckily, I was able to see in my conversations with him, he was reading Samashrita, Yepada Pallava Pavam with me, and he was more peaceful than I was. I was full of like, and he was like, it's okay, mommy. Like everything will be okay. He was the one telling me everything was okay. And I had to ask him if this is the end, Rajubita, like, is it gonna oh be all right? God. And he came up with some amazing realizations that I'm not comfortable to share right now, maybe another time, but I'll probably just like, start crying in front of everybody. But he came up with some incredible realizations and then it hit me that this bhakti parenting knowledge needs to be given far and wide. And so that's one reason why I took this as my responsibility. And it was almost like the Lord was saying like, do it and don't falter and put aside all the other desires and issues and whatever you may have, like you were saying, we have no choice. We have to do this. So we have to raise the next generation. Our, gener our world is becoming more and more entrenched in Kali Yuga and more and more material. You know, there's continuous problems every decade, every year. And if we each individually don't take upon ourselves the grave responsibility to nurture the next generation, then we, what is the point of our existence? You have children in your home. What is the point of your existence? And especially as Hindus and, uh, you know, not necessarily Indians, I'm saying as Sanatan Dharma lovers, if, if we call ourselves Hindu, then then it is it is our responsibility to take on this um you know take this seriously learn it in our own lives practice it and share it like i it's not just it, it's not just theoretical because these are practical tools that we can use and why should we succumb to uh, antidepressants and painkillers i mean they all have a place i'm not saying that it's wrong but i'm saying actually a lot of mental uh, burdens can be lightened by having this spiritual practice so why, why can't we also use that as a if you just from a material perspective see the benefit of actually having a spiritual practice like what you're describing gopi this experience and how you came out shining like a bright star on the other side as opposed to being completely devastated and broken and you know your child saying don't worry mommy that to me is <laughs> I, you know, it, it's, you, I wouldn't believe it if I saw it in a movie, but I know it's true because you are sharing that to me. So um, it's priceless. And I just, uh, I'm so grateful that you're doing this. And as for any Hindu, any Sanatan Dharmi out here, we need to take this seriously. We, we really need to, as parents, we need to be practicing and sharing with our children and the next generation because this will save them. It will change their life. And um, the, the Christians are doing it. The Muslims are doing it. They have so many fake schools all over the world. <laughs> but it's only us Hindus who are not interested in our culture and our history and what the philosophy is or, or sending our children to these kind of faith schools. And, and then that's children. very sad. And it's sad. And then those children, all of our children that are in our homes, that we're putting so much more priority, which, yes, academic success is important. School is important. Money is important. Nice house, comfortable life. All of this is very important. You can do that with Krishna. You can do that side by side with Krishna. Here is Kishori Jani. Here am I. We're showing you we can do it side by side. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. But what ends up happening is we put more faith and more intense attention to that side, and then our children become adults, and then catastrophe hits. Every home will have some, whether it be cancer, or whether it be a relationship broken, or whether it be children, not difficulty with children, catastrophe mm -hmm. will always hit your home. It's mm -hmm. There's gonna be some, some problem, some challenge everywhere. And then you run to Krishna, is it not? Or then you run to God, where is God? Why God is doing this? Is it not better to bring God alongside your your whole childhood? Make him your child's best friend. He yeah. has somebody that he or she can always depend on, always be with. And then that child can walk into any environment. I can say this from experience. My young son is now 15. 
he wasn't technically necessarily as bright. He wasn't reading at two. He was reading at four and a half as the elder one. But he can walk into an environment, laugh, joke, be confident, do an interview, a job interview. You know, he went and won drone competition just because he has this faith. Krishna is by my side. My mother sees, blossoms me, and I know I got this. I can do this. And your child as a teenager, as a 20-year-old, as a 30-year-old will face any challenge. You can ask Kishori her challenges. You can ask me my challenges. Whatever. They come, they go, we keep going because we know Krishna is our best friend and he will always take care of us. This is the biggest gift you can give to your child. Make Krishna your best friend. And Kishore, you said that yesterday. That's like my number one sentence. It's so Make true. Krishna your best, your child's best friend. And it starts very early on. Like my little three-year-old, two-year-old, I always tell them he's your best friend. Whenever he asks, who's Krishna? Who's God? I'm just like, he's your best friend. It's not... That is that is a that is a real tool to to be convinced that you have someone looking after you with just perfect love in their heart for you. Like how empowering that is that is for a child to know and to feel and to recognize. But I love what you said that we we shouldn't wait until why wait till later on when it's when we're forced to do it. Why not do it in a positive light from the beginning? And then, and then the questions like the lady was asking, how to create a spiritual, you know, practice so, in the so way. So it, wouldn't come up. it wouldn't come up. But then if you have teenagers, you're in that situation right now. So the first thing is notice their qualities that are already spiritual. Paint the picture for them that you see them as divine beings. My Pidaji and Mummy, so we had Gornitai Shivram Maharaj installed in our home one month before I was born. And Mummy said to me in my childhood that, oh, you were brought to us by Gornitai. You are from another world. You were brought to us by the Lord. And I'm like, I know how much like nonsense I am. <laughs> I'm not some divine being that was brought to your home by the Lord, but she always made us feel like we were God's gift to her. And mm -hmm. same with your teenagers. We tend to focus in because they're separating. Psychologically, they must separate from you right now. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to grow into individual beings that make decisions without mom and dad there because they mm -hmm. will have to do that in their life. And yeah. so right now they have to separate. Every time they separate yeah. from you, they say no to you, what we call rebellion. You should see it as, oh, if I can accept this, I'm empowering my child to become independent and confident. And so using that separation, there are tricks to engage your child in spiritual activities. Using the tool, knowing that they will become separate and this is part of their growth, you work with it instead of working against yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And so one simple one, and I do give a, um, a teenage seminar as well, but I'll give one simple one that has worked magic. Go spend some time with your child doing something they enjoy doing. Wow. Just hang out. Okay, for me, the bane of my existence, Kishori, is video games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't we know all about that? Oh, goodness. Like, you, we were raised where video games were complete. No, no. All no, three no. of my family no members. Screen, are no screen time, nothing. <laughs> All three of my family members are completely plugged in. I did not allow Reju or Nitai to watch unregulated TV until they were 12, 13. It was pretty strict about the TV and the screen time. But yeah. he's 18 and he's 16. I'm not going to control their screen time. At this <laughs> you know, we're in America and I'm not going to put unnecessary heavy yeah. control on them at that age. And so I realized, you know, they're, they're moderate. They enjoy it. They're moderate about it. They also finish up all their school, all their Krishna conscious activities. And so it is what it is. I've accepted it. One day I decided you can't beat them, beat them, join them. Sure. And I went upstairs and I sat with him. I saw he was playing and I thought, okay, I know my kids are really smart, really sweet kids. Why is this so interesting to them? And yeah. sorry, I sat with the younger one and just watched and how much strategy and skill is required and there was literally it was eye opening how much strategy and intelligence was required it's to navigate amazing. this yeah yes. and yes. i spent maybe 15 minutes with him he started explaining all the different avatars that you wear and the different types of in, um, weapons and you know i started like oh that reminds me of that oh really and then he's like can i show you how to do it and i started doing it with him Kishori, for at least two or three weeks later, that boy was like cleaning dishes with me, 
while, um, uh, carrying all the groceries. It was like I showed interest in something he was interested in without judgment. And he suddenly felt like I connected to his heart. I connected to his needs. Instead of just shutting them aside, as we do with teenagers, oh, they're not good enough, they're not strong enough, they're not capable enough, just because they're doing something that may be a little bit out of the box of what we do. I'm not saying that if you want your child to chant Hare Krishna, go play video games. No. <laughs> I'm saying find what your child is interested in and spend time with them. Then expect that they will spend time with you in bhakti practices. For a young one, it may be ice cream and pizza. You know, that's like just, a, it's not necessarily ice cream. It's not necessarily healthy for all the sugar. Um, and th I, but anyways, you get the idea. I just, I, I find this so powerful what you're saying because you, you're sharing it for teenagers, but I can vouch that it also works for on my nine-year-old, 10-year-old. You know, he comes home and he's just such a chatterbox. He wants to tell me about everything and, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I got so many things to do, but yeah. but I make it a point to listen to him and to engage and ask questions that he finds are, you know, relevant. And um, I 100% agree with the idea that if you want to to understand your child, like you want them to understand you, if you want that connection where they respect your views and your practices, they they respect your choices in life. If you respect theirs, if you give them the worth, you know, that they feel they have, it's, it's, just, it's a matter of respect. It's just a matter of putting down your ego at that point and thinking, okay, um, you know, if I show them that I value your time, I value you as a person and I value your choices, then they'll do the same to us. I, I, it makes complete sense to me. And whenever I spend that time with, with in a meaningful way, doing what they love, um, there's definitely an issue. Sorry, um, I definitely see the difference. Then they're they're so much more engaged in what we are sharing with them, and it's a give and take. Then, then when we say to do the art and chant, he, he doesn't fight with it at all. Because it's there's a person above me that doesn't understand me. That's just throwing rules at me. It's that yes. this is a person that's by my side that's working with me, that knows me, that trusts me, and that I'd, I'd love to spend some time with them as well yeah. in what is the important thing. And I yeah. always find that my natural critical mind tends to want to cut off anything they're doing, even if it's spiritual, to immediately yeah. say a negative remark against the spiritual. And this is mm -hmm. the worst thing to do with teenagers. So we had a, a father who approached me who I'm counseling and who approached me that on Thanksgiving, his daughter chose to go to a Friendsgiving, Friendsgiving's a new thing here, on Saturday instead of come to the temple. On Sunday, she didn't have her homework done in time, so she couldn't mm -hmm. come to the temple on Sunday. And he was expressing frustration, Mataji, how do yeah. I deal with this? How do I work mm -hmm. with this? And I said, okay, tell me a little bit about your daughter. Well, she's a really good cook. And what she did to her friend's living is she made a whole meal for everybody, offered it to the Didis, and took it to her friends as Prashad. And that oh, she beautiful. herself wanted to like give Prashad. I said, oh my goodness, what is more important? What do you think Krishna wants? To see her face in some kirtan on Sunday? Or to cook Prashad for all of these friends of hers and go and oh, offer them with so much love? Let's look at the things that our children are doing already. If you've already raised them with bhakti, by the time they're teenagers, they are already Krishna conscious. Now they're going to separate from you. So your yeah. manifestation of it, especially after 16, their manifestation of it will be a little different than your manifestation of it. Be peaceful and give it time and let them work it out on their own. Let, let them go. go. To it on their own. It's a time for a lot more as taking a step back, trusting, mm -hmm and only looking at the good wow that is so incredible we've totally gone over but i i'm just yes <laughs> no no I'm, this is such a that's such an important topic so close to my heart and i'm just uh, enjoying this so much and people are still watching so we just got a few more that i really want to go over just um briefly if we could go over how to start like let's say there's someone watching this and they are not part of iskan they're not part of the devotee community if yes. you're not, I highly recommend you find a, a devo devotional community because, you know, association is so powerful. But uh, to Gopi, how would someone start? What are some basic things they can do um, to, to start? 
Yes. The most, the most, the quickest connection you can make with your child is through reading to them. So wow. the best way to start is at nighttime. Yes. You pick up a book, you cuddle yes. up with them, and you read. And if they don't read yet, you read to them. And if you want, if you're not as creative as Kishori is in making the story so magical, just let the words speak and make it magical. And make reading Krishna stories the most nurturing, enjoyable time with your child. And do it, if you can't do it every night, do it two nights a week. You can do this at any age. My kids are 18 and 16, and they're not like super perfect, docile kids who are submissive. And they're very American, very in their own like life now. But what we do as a family is at least once a week, we read Srimad Bhagavatam together. And now when I, there's certain ways to read, right? When you're reading the scripture, it's like quiet, no unnecessary talk. We're like all going to become... Um, Parikshit Maharaj is here and get in the zone. And that's my idea of reading, right? That's how I was, you know, I was raised in Bhagavatam classes. Yeah. My husband, he is the most joyful, connected person with the boys when it comes to reading. We wow. make jokes, we question the Sanskrit, we debate the topics. Well, what would a scientist say about this? What are yeah. your thoughts on this? What is a movie that was connected to what we make it relevant to the kids, especially as they get older? When they're younger, I it's really it. hard to read the kids. When they get older, it needs to be relevant to them. It needs to be meaningful to them. And so the best thing to do, quickest way to connect your children to Krishna consciousness is through reading. So as they get older, you can start delving into the philosophy, the actual verses. When they're younger, start with the stories. There's so many Mahabharat, Krishna book, you go on krishna.com and there's tons of stories there. Amar Chitrakata is amazing. Get yes. stories and read. Um, and then if you were in this situation, what would you do? Do you agree with the way that person did that? Ask them deeper questions of asking what they would do and just in your conversation. Wow. Wow. I just, I want to just resonate that and, you know, say that again a hundred times because that is absolutely key. And I remember even as a child growing up, um, hearing the lectures and reading, those were the most uh, powerful things that have actually lasted, you know, stood the test of time. And I still use those tools today, whatever, because it actually has to knowledge, right? Krishna talks about knowledge is what is going to set us free. But, yes. Um, um, so, the, and and as a family, what you're sharing, uh, we we do that every night with our kids. Uh, we share a story, and I can just vouch for it a hundred percent because it takes over all the conversations later on. Even when you're not reading, they're like, "Oh yeah." Then we come back to it and we ask questions about it. So you end up meditating on that through so many different. Uh, you know, parts of the day and, and areas in life. And I love what you say about connecting the movies and connecting the, <laughs> they, they do that all the time. You know, we compare which, uh, you know, when, when, when someone's fighting someone, Hari Dev's always like, well, would Hulk win or would Krishna win? You know? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it, has to be, it has to be relevant, it has to be fun for them. So that, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So if anyone missed that, reading with your children as often or as, whenever as regularly as you can i can definitely agree with that that is um one last one should we take uh, right someone's asking about the bhagavad gita there's I it's on that question. i have received my copy of bhagavad gita as it is by shila Prabhupada today congratulations you have gotten the most invaluable gift in your home and do i engage my five and a half year old to read it so first tell them the stories behind the Bhagavad Gita. Talk to them about who Krishna is. Talk to, teach him who Krishna is. Who is Krishna? Why is he talking this story of Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna? Why is it important? Go to the background of what is being explained. He's five, he can understand these stories. There are good guys, there are bad guys, they're in a big fight. Arjuna is scared, he's worried, but he has to do what's right. Tell him the story and then we have a really amazing system in the school where we learn the verses, the words of Krishna through song. And yeah. we actually sing it with hand movements. I know Kishori teaches similarly, where we sing the shlokas through hand movements. And these shlokas, even if they don't right now understand the specific meaning of the chat of the words. Now, Kishori is an interesting thing in our movement right now where some are saying it's not 
why is Sanskrit important? They don't understand the meaning. But actually, Srila Prabhupada has shared that those words will go in their subconscious. And when they need it the most, when they're adults, those words will come back to them just like the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and carry them through their challenges. And Kishori, in this regard, I'm going to share one story. I had a yeah. uh, young so student. Sorry, 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 Gopi, just one minute. Is it possible to turn off your volume on your Instagram live because it's, it is creating a bit of a feedback? Is, it, is, it, is your volume off? Like, you know, your media volume? The volume is as low as it can go. And for some okay. reason, it's not turning off. Let's see if there's a, right. a click. Hold on. I can. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. Sorry about that. Next time, maybe I'll spend more time in prayer. <laughs> no so I you were sharing it. about um, a story about... Um, My student. Student. student, yeah. So I've covered the speaker, so hopefully the volume will work that way. But let's see. Oh, <laughs> I see you juggling both of them with your hands. This is Seva. It's Seva. Krishna's going to appreciate your effort today, Gopi. <laughs> okay, so... So my student, um, this is a young girl who came to her parents, moved to the community for the school. She wanted their, her parents wanted her to be in our Gurukul. She was of Indian background from South India, really young, seven years old. She entered my class in second grade. And we became very close as we do with all the children. You know, they're all just like family or with them every day, all day teaching them. And yeah. suddenly in November of her, I believe it was her ninth year, uh, she faced a pretty major catastrophe. And okay. every single day in my in the elementary class with our students, we teach Bhagavad Gita. So every year they learn 40 verses. They they do one verse a week. And like that, we do through 36 verses. 36 weeks, we do 36 verses. And then the wow. next year, the same students learn it again. And by the time you're in your third year of learning the Bhagavad Gita, you're delving into so much fun of stories and philosophy in the sadhana class. And so she was in her third year and we were just going through the second chapter of the body, how we're not the body, and the Yam Purano. So we like, we're strong, we can take anything, we can do anything in all these verses. We have so much fun in enacting them. And the kids love the verses. It's like the funnest part for them. Even today in COVID, I come in and the first thing they're all doing is singing the songs and singing the verses. I stand in the room of all the meanings and we put together the songs. Sometimes I change up the tunes so that they can add their own tune. And so we're in just bliss of this. And November, the week before Thanksgiving, I get a call at two in the morning and my close friend says, you got to come right now to the temple. There's been a fire right across the street from her house. Her house has caught on fire. Um, her, she was staying at a friend's house in the neighborhood. Her mother, her father passed away right then and there. Oh, Krishna. Her mother is now in the hospital. And this was at a time where we were, I was reevaluating the academic slash spiritual instruction in the school. How much time can be given to spiritual? How much time can be given to academic? Because we, there's only a certain amount of time in the day. And questioning also like Gita, um, I do it for three years straight. Should I, should I not? Should I start something else with the elementary? And this girl hung on to those verses of the Gita during that time period. The next morning, um, it was over a weekend and Monday morning she came to school. We asked her, it's okay if you don't want to come to school. Her mother was in the hospital with um, third degree burns. So I actually ended up going to their aunt's house and spending the night with her and really taking care of her during that time. And she, um, the psychologist came to talk to the whole school and to talk to her first and then talk to the whole school, a Christian lady from Texas, and Vikasni, her name is Vikasni, and she may watch this. Hare Krishna, my loving Vikasni, I love you so much. And in South India, she's doing very well. But she um, she went to the psychologist and spoke to the psychologist so powerfully. They had just learned yam yam vapi smaran bhavam, tejatyante kalivaram, tam tam evaiti kaunteya sada tad bhava bhavita. Whatever consciousness you're in, at that time, you will attain me. And we were doing hand movements and talking about the spiritual planets and what they look like. And for her and her another, it was so meaningful and relevant at that time that she grasped those words of Krishna as, as her life and soul. And she's wow. sitting there explaining it to the 
psychologist. Yeah, I really miss him. This was like two weeks later, one month later, the psychologist kept coming. Yes, I really miss them, but I know that they're with Krishna. I know because these are the reasons I know. And she, psychologist came and sat with all of us in the whole school and the teachers are there to talk to all the students. And then the psychologist said, Vikasni, do you want me to explain to the students what happened? Or do you want to explain it? And Vikasni said, you can explain it. And the psychologist who is not bhakti practitioner uh, starts explaining what Vikasni has explained to her about what happens. And she started asking difficult questions to the children. Do you know what death is? Do you know what happens at the time of death? And Vikasni jumps up with Madhava and Vishaka and all these kids and runs to get their Bhagavad Gita packets and sings these Bhagavad Gita songs that they're like, yeah, we know what happens. Yeah, they're only seven and nine. Some could say, oh, do they really know? But he went through this life of this knowing what happens. And that mm -hmm. for me was the most powerful indication that teaching your children Bhagavad Gita at a young age is the very best thing you can do because you're preparing them for the worst of catastrophes in a loving way. That, hey, you can actually become close to Krishna because he is real. And no matter what happens to you, Krishna will carry you through it. Now, this is an extreme example. I pray this happens to no other child ever in this world. The fact of the matter is that this will happen to every individual, child or not, this will happen. And better to have your child know that and remember that in deep in her internal psyche at five and a half than to have to figure that out at age 35 or age 50 or better to have that strength at age five. Exactly. And not, not only like exactly. and when the children have their strength, they share it with others. And so yeah. you brought the Bhagavad Gita, just open up the books first, talk about the stories, always stories with little kids, and then talk about the strength. And if you need help on that, contact me. And we're creating yeah. a building curriculum for this. Contact Kishori. She also teaches Bhagavad Gita very nicely. <laughs> we're just, uh, this is incredible. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gopi. And, um, you know, we, I think we need to do this more often again because that was so powerful and so inspiring. And I want to know so much more. We barely even scratched the surface. I wanted to know tips. Gopi has so many tips to share for all ages of children to how, how to aid their learning and especially, especially spiritual learning and to make it easy and fun for them. So um, maybe we'll do another session because we, we have so much more to talk about. But uh, in closing, I just wanted to ask you to just share your three important uh, things that you would want every parent to know, um, important guiding principles, if, if you may. Okay, so the important, I have I have two that I can think of right this minute. Okay, the third one is also there. But uh, <laughs> the first one is Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarva Karma Kritahoi. And this is something that Krishna is reminding me of and teaching me more and more every day by chanting and performing, by performing bhakti yoga practices, nine processes of Krishna consciousness. Everything else gets covered everything yeah. is covered That's and true. i'm still getting confidence in this i'm still i'm not a hundred percent committed to this but i'm still working on my own confidence by chanting my 16 rounds by engaging in krishna conscious activities my kids their academic success is taken care of their material success is taken care of the meals get made the balance gets created my makeup wow. turns up right the lighting works <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, sometimes laptops fall, fail. But <laughs> as a general rule, if you prioritize your bhakti practices, Krishna carries everything else. And so that's the first thing. <laughs> everything else is so powerful. I 100% agree with that. Now, it's the, it doesn't look perfect. You may think that it should look like this. The whole point of doing bhakti is to understand surrender. You may think that, well, the interview should have looked like this. And if you get flustered, oh, well, why did the, you know, how could the, if you get flustered by the computer shutting down, then you're not actually surrendering to Krishna. <laughs> so the whole point of bhakti is to just surrender. And when you surrender, like you're saying, when you, when you practice those nine uh, angas of bhakti, everything feels like it's taken care of because you have surrendered. So you accept every situation with so much grace and gratitude and love that that is what you give off in everything you do. And that's what comes back in and that's what you give off. So 
it's such a beautiful thing you're saying. It's not going to look perfect because someone uh, posted one of the questions was, well, you know, if I, you know, Krishna says, I'll take care of everything. But then why do devotees suffer? Why were temples destroyed? Why were, you know, why does all this injustice happen? But actually, the point is not that no suffering will come to us. It, it's not that it's going to look perfect just because we have Krishna in our lives. Look at Jesus Christ's life, how much he had to suffer, being the son of God himself. You know, it, look at Krishna's life. His own parents were put into jail. <laughs> you know, the Pandavas, Kunti Devi, who doesn't suffer? That's not the goal of, it's not to like everything will become perfect. But the actually, the, the point is in surrender, in understanding our eternal loving relationship we don't actually need to control the externals it doesn't matter what it is the suffering becomes surrender the suffering becomes just another part of the day just as good as happiness suffering happiness same to same <laughs> it's so i love kishori how you speak it's just so oh, interesting it's so i love how you speak that that point that you're making about it's because of surrender to krishna and it's true it doesn't look it may not look perfect, right? My life is far from <laughs> with my husband, my kids. You know, our lives are like we're two little girls here talking about Krishna who were raised in pretty intense, amazing, but intense homes. And here we are holding our phones and our lights. And <laughs> <laughs> so number two, number two. It's so important to say that Krishna does take care of. It's the connection with Krishna. He does. He takes care of it all. So that's my first point. My second point is. Krishna Arthi Akila Cheshta, everything you do for the Lord. So that means everything. I'm telling you every single thing. Lord, whether or not you like that I'm doing this, I'm doing it for you. <laughs> I'm going to watch this movie for you. <laughs> Offer everything. Everything. All the desires, no desires, everything do for the Lord. Krishna, I'm sleeping for you. Krishna, I'm engaging in my my sacrifice for you. Krishna, I'm right now not feeling like I want to do bhakti practices, and I'm a little annoyed about such and such and such. But you know what? I belong to you, and everything I do is for you. So I need you to accept this as well. Go to the Lord with your full, authentic self. And this was our first conversation, wasn't it, Kishori? Yeah. Me in the UK with all those beautiful the greenery and all that. This was my I remember the most one of the most powerful memories of my life when we had this conversation. Mm. To go to Krishna for everything, do everything for yes. Krishna. Yes, yes. Oh my God, you just hit home. It really hit hit home so so vividly. Absolutely. Whether it's you know what you're saying with your authentic self and just tell Krishna this is who I am and but I'm yours. Whether I'm you know, with all my weaknesses, with all my flaws, I'm yours. And that, again, even psychologically, it's such a powerful feeling of 100% acceptance. I know, Avashya Rakhi De Krishna, the first, uh, you know, the first symptom of full surrender to Krishna is that you know in your heart 100% that he, he accepts you. He will take care of you. He's got your back, loves you. And um, that... <laughs> Is forget priceless. It's just that's what carries us through lifetimes, not just this life, lifetimes. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing that. And then my last one, and this is more for me and because of my nature, and Kishori might have remembered me when I was much younger. I'm very serious. I'm just a little too serious. <laughs> no, she's always bubbly. That's not true. But I love that inside you're very deep. Very I, I was telling her yesterday that actually I remember. Whenever me and her get together, it goes, the superficialities fly out very fast and then quickly we just dive in. And I yes. love that. And so don't take life too seriously. That's my last thing. With your kids, when they make mistakes, just smile it off. It's okay. Everything will be okay. It will be okay. And laugh, sing, dance. Don't take life too seriously. That and so that's my third one. <laughs> Yeah, the philosophy is important, but it's got to be positive. It's got to be fun. It's got to be uh, practical. Wow, thank you so much. I don't want to sign off, but we've gone an hour and a half. And oh, wow. <laughs> my, <laughs> oh. the kids are knocking on the door and stuff. I don't we'll, know how much we can. I love sharing Krishna Bhakti with you, Kishori. I love that we have this soul connection that takes us yeah. straight up to Golok Vrindavan. I feel so, so blessed and honored right to be your friend. Them. 
Same here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to all of you watching, thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with us today. And please share this. Please share this because we need everybody. We need everyone to um, join with this effort to spiritualize the next generation and to empower them and to make them happy in their lives. And um, we need everyone. <laughs> we need all your help. We need everyone to be on this um, the same page. Yes, and if you have children, if you have five-year-olds, or I'm telling you from experience, there when they were two, it was like yesterday. My son is now 18, and it oh goes like gosh. this. It goes yes. so fast. Whatever yeah. you can do to give bhakti, nurture bhakti in your children, and do visit me at gopigita.com <laughs> and check out everything that we have to offer. Gopigita.com, and are you on Instagram as well, right? Yes, gopi.gita.s and Facebook okay. is Gopi Gita Shomaker, S C H O M A K E R. <laughs> I'll post the link again. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you uh, not next Saturday because we're moving. I'm moving houses, so pray for us. <laughs> it's going to be traumatic again. But the weekend after, we'll be back with uh, another session on another Saturday. And continue Bye. watching Kishori as much as you can and share this video and share all of Kishori's yeah. videos because every time you hit that share button of a video of Kishori Jani, you are directly engaging in the Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Oh. And all it takes is one click. It's like the easiest way. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We need all your blessings. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. Okay. And bro.